Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to uh, our session on embedded assessment in learning, and uh, otherwise known as reinventing education. My name is Donald Brinkman. I'm a program manager here at Microsoft Research. Uh, the, I work with external researchers in the areas of games for learning, digital humanities, and digital heritage. Uh, today, our focus, and really the focus for me for this summit, is all about education. And, uh, I have uh, three speakers here. Uh, we're we're a little running a little bit late, so I'm going to keep my introductions mercifully brief. And I'm just going to say that Kurt Squire, he's our first speaker. Uh, he's the director of the Games Learning and Society in Initiative, and he is uh, one of the foremost minds in, in games for education in the world today. And without further ado, I will let him tell you very interesting things. Thank you. All right, um, hear me? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. Um, I, uh, you should have a break after that session next time because I don't, I don't like following Ken. I thought this was pretty awesome. <laughs> so um, I will humbly try to show what we're doing, and um, but you're actually, hopefully, you'll see some real through lines. Um, I really dug his last bit about pedagogy. I thought it was awesome. So um, I'm currently actually on leave from the University of Wisconsin. I'm um, currently a creative director and senior investigator at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that's about, what we're up to, and hopefully get a discussion going about where we see kind of the future of games, learning, and assessment. Um, I'm going to rush through the beginning parts a little bit just to try to get to the assessment. But um, if someone can also help me on time a little bit, because I think I, this could go a, a tad long. Um, so in terms of you know, what kinds of games and how do I think about games and learning, um, this is the, a, a very brief, shameless plug. I'm sorry, but I've got a, I've got a book. They told me to do this. Um, but um, the, basically the argument, but I'm, I'll give you the whole argument so you don't have to you know, bother reading if you don't want. But basically the idea is that games um, are models that represent ideas as interactive worlds. And I think, again, uh, Ken uh, builds on a lot of what he was talking about. Um, and one of the ways that we learn is we come to understand the properties of that model by playing around with it, seeing how it behaves as a system, and get, doing these cycles of, of trying something, seeing how it works, perceiving what happens, are ways that we learn from games. Um, but unlike traditional simulations and, and models, I think what's really cool about games, they tend to pique our interest in new domains. They, they get that uh, fire going that Ken was talking about. So they, they, they get us interested in things we might not ordinarily be into. And um, as a kind of gamer, game des well, would-be game designer, someone who tries to hire good game designers, um, good games really pay attention to the aesthetics of the overall experience in ways that educators traditionally have not. Um, this is, I think, especially important in any sort of attention economy where you can't assume that your students are paying attention. You know, they're going to be online. They have broadband multimedia po uh, uh, devices in their pockets. Um, so, so this is something that's going to be increasingly important to educators. Um, so um, one of the things that are interesting is that games are a, a fundamentally about problems, problem solving. And we learn through uh, gameplay and developing these new kinds of skills. And then if you look at game communities, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, what we do is, is we, gaming and sense making is usually happens within particular communities where knowledge is legitimized, knowledge is given certain status. There are ways of, say, reading and inferring games that happen as a social experience. So what I mean by that, I can play um, SimCity, and I can think that the game is really about, um, I don't know, space exploration, if you want to do that. But where the certain meanings get negotiated is usually in a, con a social context of some sort. And this is kind of education theory 101. Um, and what I'm interested in doing is creating these kinds of community game structures that can let people become new kinds of people. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the work I'm doing now is based out of the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, as I mentioned. And um, it's kind of interesting because we're the educational game design group within a building that has pharmaceutical informatics, regenerative biology, optimization, computational technology, systems biology, medical devices, and um, again, this kind of educational research, which is a bit unusual. And you can see some of the other kinds of things that we do. Um, also interesting about this is that half of this building is private. And then the other half is public, so we can uh, build games and then try to sell them, or we can write grants. We can do all kinds of kind of interesting things. And our group actually sits in the middle, so we kind of jump over here and act like a private group, and then over here as a public group, which is really which is really kind of cool. Um, 
So um, our philosophy is we're trying to make games that really make discovery visible. So make it, what's it like, what happens inside this building? And what are the things that these scientists are doing? And can we communicate that to the public? So we're not starting with K-12 students in schools. I mean, it'd be great if teachers and schools took these up. But you know, if, if not, that's, that's OK. Um, and then hopefully give them the thrill of the experience of discovery. And then ultimately, and we're still a ways away from this, but ultimately use these games as a way to springboard people into participating in the science itself. So um, these are kind of the four game, uh, main game prototypes that we have going. Um, all of them are available if you are interested and going to contact me. Some are already out and available. So the first one is um, around gender bias in the, in the STEM disciplines. Uh, Aaron Robinson is a lead game designer on that. Um, second one, Virulent, is for the iPad. I'll be talking a little bit more about that. That's actually on the iTunes store now. Um, uh, the third one is uh, called Trails Forward. It's a conservation game. And then the last one is a, um, a cancer detection game, which I'll be talking about. And then we have another one built with filament games called Citizen Science, which I'll be talking a little bit more about, too. So this is kind of our, our first suite of games. And eventually, we imagine having 20, 30, 40 um, happening. Um, but again, these games, I think what makes them interesting is that they're based we, as much as we can on cutting edge discoveries. So these are things that we go to, go to the scientists in the building and say, what are you working on? What are you discovering? And then we work with them. So this is a, a game based on the virology group that's working on studying viruses and designing viruses that will eventually be used as form of medicine, right? Going it, like you're going to take this virus as a way to treat a disease. Um, cancer are the, the first sort of things that they're targeting. Um, that seemed kind of weird to me when I heard it. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is science fiction. We can build a game. If you can't build a game about that, then you know. We're not doing any good. Um, so the, the first uh, game is, again, called Virulent. It's out for the iPad right now, a very mini kind of version. I, there's a lot of talk I heard at the break about you know, how do you think about designing games for learning and what's the mix between um, you know, doing design and backwards engineering from assessment. Um, one thing I really strongly believe is that if you let your assessment kind of cart drive your game design horse too much, and I think this is probably what Jason will be talking about, you can really screw yourself over in a big way. Um, I think it's important to figure out where the game is, where it's interesting, and then what can you do to try to measure it, rather than saying, well, you know, this is how we're going to measure, and then we're going to work back from there. So our first step is, and say this is a game that's about 20% done, is to actually get it out there and see what people do, see what they like, um, see what works. So in the first month, we've had about 1,000 downloads, which isn't huge, but it's, it's, it's not bad either. Um, our initial findings that we're getting from this, and we've run it through um, about another 200 kids, both in controlled studies and classroom studies, kids coming through our lab, is that um, there's a high interest in the content. So it, it, it's hitting that kind of doesn't make it interesting. Um, the players are using the images as a way to learn more complex material. So when we do uh, think aloud protocols and we did pre-post tests, they're actually using the images as a way to think through it. So if we give them images, they can kind of put it together and recreate how a cell works. They're still not getting the words yet. So we're um, now working on building in features to do that. Um, the biggest finding, actually, is that it's been a real good context for interdisciplinary collaboration. So we set the, the virologists down to play it. And then we set the epidemiologists down to play it and the immunologists to play it. And all three of them liked certain parts and then thought other parts were irrelevant unrealistic, and they started arguing with each other. Like, that's not how the body acts. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And, and so um, and of course, any, any representation is a simplification, right? You know, a, a, a movie, a book, they all you know, boil things down, simplify some things. So what's interesting is it's got us thinking a lot about what is the nature of one representation versus another. And you might end up having three, four, or five different versions to capture different kinds of ideas. Um, along those same lines, uh, Trails Forward is a game that we're working on that's really, really young. It's just in its first couple of weeks. But this is one where the scientists themselves came to us and said, um, uh, we're working across all of the different ecology disciplines, as well as things like e economics and political science. And we're studying what is the future of Wisconsin around conservation issues? Like, What's going to be the economic impact, say, if we uh, reintroduce wolf species in certain parts, or if we change a particular policy around, uh, well, ATVs, all-terrain vehicles, is one of the big ones right now. Um, what's that going to do to tourism? And what's that going to do to this, that, and the other? And they wanted to build an interactive model for them to kind of have these arguments. So um, what we did is we started building this Trails Forward game. This is uh, working with um, a variety of people, DNR agent, Michael Ferris, who's an optimization specialist, and one of our game designers, just taking the, the state of Wisconsin as a map and building it, turning it into a game. Uh, the current game world is Vilas County, Wisconsin. Um, it's, um, you can see it's 900,000, over 900,000 square, square acre tiles. And we've got some basic roles in the game. So you're, uh, yeah, you can see, <laughs> ranger, developer, timber company. And this is, these are kind of simplifications of what actually happens up north. But these are based on, um, we got these from the people themselves who, who study this. Um, the core game cycles around buying and selling property, lobbying the state for different things, and then lobbying for zoning. Um, now, one thing that's kind of cool is that, I'm, as I mentioned, this is actually Vilas County. So we imported data sets from uh, the researchers themselves. It's, down, it's accurate down to about the acre. And on each game tile, um, here we, we can tell you, whoops, um, 
Yeah, so each tile right now has properties based on actual data on um, the land type, tree density, housing density, and so on. Now, if the game designers out there might be saying, well, that's interesting, but you know, the world as it comes to us may not inherently be an interesting game. Um, and that's kind of one of the key issues that you always wrestle with is that where do you simplify, where do you cheat? So one thing that we're doing um, right away is we're building a very open, whoops, a very open architecture. So that we've got our kind of core base game. We're gonna build different game clients for different crowds. So maybe there's some things that we want elementary kids to get out of it, some things for high school kids, and then some things for the researchers themselves. So if the researchers wanna go and run a series of models to see like a predictive modeling, they can do that. We're, here's a way you can write your own bots, plug in, use it however you want. But then we may make some simplifications. Um, the other nice thing is that we can start with one county, but once we've got that determined, we can upload all of Wisconsin and, and kind of go nuts with it. So that game's under um, development right now. Again, it's all open source. If anyone's doing research related to anything in this, um, feel free to contact us. Um, and then games that actually might help you discover this experience of really helping someone with science. Um, so this game came out of this kind of um, idea of, um, and the best way to explain it is just step back and say, well, what would happen if you had cancer? Um, well, first, you usually experience some symptoms. Um, you then go in for some testing. They do some imaging. Um, you'll get a diagnosis from a doctor. And then there's some form of a, a treatment. Um, the, the treatment usually boils down to one of three things. They either cut it out, they either poison you, or they try to burn it out. Um, and this is the, the, the saying that came from the um, uh, Rock Mackey, who invented, uh, radiation therapist who invented this technology. So for imaging, um, this is what the images look like. This is a patient who um, had breast cancer. And they go, basically, they take these slices going down the body to, and take pictures of you to see where there's anomalies. Um, from there, there's a diagnosis. So this is a doctor who diagnosed this is where the tumor is. Um, now, what's interesting, and this is why Rock came to us, there's actually a lot of variation in how doctors diagnose this. There's about 20% in breast cancer. So if you line up a bunch of different doctors, you're going to get about 20% difference in what they, where they think the cancer is. Um, lung cancer is a factor of two. Cervical cancer is three to four. So hopefully I've convinced you to get a second and third and fourth opinion and to um, do some research into this. Um, from there, you go into treatment. And as you might imagine, your treatments are going to be different based on what, how they, where they see the tumor is and what they think this is supposed to be doing. And this really is not good for patients. This is, this is one of the real struggles that um, the field is, is working with right now. So what we imagine is instead, imagine if you have your, um, your diagnosis, but then you get a second one, a third one, a fourth one, potentially a, a millionth one. Um, and this is a lot of our, um, this game was actually inspired by Foldit and Zoran's group here. You know, um, so that this is very much in kind of an intellectual conversation with that. So we say, Imagine not getting a second or third opinion, but a doctor who's still going to make the main opinion, but working with two million different people who've given a bunch of different um, uh, diagnoses. So what we've built is something called Anatomy Pro-Am. And the basic game teaches you about anatomy, cancer, medical careers. The most basic version, which we've got a working demo of built with filament games, is meant to really introduce kids to this. But then the idea is that by the, the high upper end, they can actually get live patient data, and that can be used to inform practice. Um, we're not there yet. We're mostly dealing with issues around regulations and, you know, can we get access to the, the um, uh, um, can we get real live patient data in there and all the permissions and so on. But we've got all the infrastructure set up to do it. So this is kind of how we imagine our four core audiences. We've got our general public who might be playing it just because they're interested. Um, you might have a family member. Um, we actually had a team member who um, had to go get some imaging and was potentially had cancer. And so I personally was very uh, motivated to try to play it and get <laughs> try to get his scans uploaded. Um, children and youth who might be playing in school. Uh, medical training is one of our other ones. And then the radi radi uh, radiologists and doctors. Again, each one might get a very different interface, but the underlying data can be shared across. Um, so this is a single player prototype. You go in, you see the symptoms, you do some um, diagnoses, you set up your radiation beams, and these are all known cases on the single player prototype. And then from there, um, you get some feedback. So our first questions were, what, would kids actually play this? And I think this is an important kind of first assessment question um, when you're thinking about assessment in games. Um, I was actually re just recently rereading um, or reading some of the Sesame Street research. Um, there's an excellent, excellent book on uh, G is for Growing is what it's called. It just looks at how Sesame Street actually got made and how they built the children's television workshop. And one of the interesting findings, they said assessment has to be in the service of when they built Sesame Street. Assessment has to be in the service of making better programming. And one of the biggest things that they've focused on is, you know, would, would kids watch this? And when would they turn the channel? When would they walk away? And I think that sort of question is really important for um, uh, game designers. Um, then going along with that, will they learn anything? What will they learn? Are you doing more harm than good? Which is always a possibility. Um, so what we did is a, a quick exploratory study with about 70 students, just a basic pretest uh, oncology post test. We imagine doing a lot more in the future, but this is just, again, in the spirit of rapid prototyping, get something out there. Um, no grant funding yet. This was all just done internally. Um, so we asked a number of questions, so open-ended questions about what radiologists do. So we saw, not surprisingly, you know, a big increase in that. 
um, contouring cancerous tumors. Again, not, not surprisingly, you know, they're, they're much better with that. Um, understandings of what's difficult, difficult about radiotherapy. So the, one of the most difficult things is you don't want to um, expose healthy tissue. You don't want to like, you know, fry the brain when you're trying to get part of your, um, um, say, uh, throat cancer um, treated. Um, they believe that it taught them about treating cancer and um, believe that it taught them about contouring tumors. Um, again, not, not uh, hugely um, surprising, but, but enough to give us the kind of encouragement that this might be something worth building and, and continuing on. Um, the most interesting thing, I think, is that students had a highly significant increase in medical professions, which is one of our goals. This was really get them to think, you know, you may not think of yourself as being a doctor, because the only doctor you've ever met is the one when you, you know, go to the ER or whatever, your family doctor. But there are a whole range of, of um, careers in this field. But then the second one, which we thought was interesting, was, was girls' self-efficacy or female self-efficacy. So females indicated a much better uh, increase in future medical professional confidence com uh, as compared to pre-game play, which matches a lot of the other research in gender and science and um, was very encouraging to us. Um, there's about a three to one ratio of men to women in this field, so it's an issue. So that was kind of our basic first prototype. From there, we said, you know, this is really good, but we're not getting any multiplayer kind of work. We're not getting kids kind of arguing, and we're f a way long way away from getting people <laughs> to kind of interact around these images. So we decided to kind of change uh, gears and make a Facebook um, application just out of curiosity to see what would happen if we made a kind of quick and dirty co-op game that's tied to their Facebook accounts, which, although now that Harvard just got, got in trouble, I have to watch this. We were, we were very excited about the idea of data mining who's playing, but um, that may be more difficult now. Um, so here's an example of what it looks like. If this works, um, it should maybe work. There's a video. Yeah, so you get a sense of kind of how it works. And what was interesting, when we started doing our tests with this, um, the pre-med students and medical faculty were the most excited about it. They said, you know, we could use this in your classes tomorrow, um, or we could use it in our classes tomorrow. So they um, select a case. They go down to their team. You recruit team members. Um, and you then ask for their input on a case. And this is, again, really just a really simple prototype, um, again, done without any real funding, just a couple of developers in a couple of months. Um, you can then go through different layers. You can try to contour and trace images and then have discussions around it. Um, we did a, um, a quick case study with this being used by um, uh, medical students. And again, they loved it. And they loved it to an extent. Um, and you can see there's kind of the chatting and the chat bubbles. As a side note, I think doing a mo uh, collaborative image kind of messing around tool so I can like doodle on my friends' pictures and their faces, I think maybe the, the first spin off of this, actually. It seems like a fun thing to do. Um, but uh, here, I'll go to the next slide. Whoops. Uh, so Dr. Lonnie Salkowski, who teaches the medical imaging, saw this and said, I think this is great. I want to start with this in the fall. So now what we're going to try to do is get the med students in there on Facebook. And, that, and then it becomes kind of interesting, because you can imagine starting to throw cases where you've got two med students, and then you've got maybe a couple of very skilled 15-year-olds in the same case working on it together. Um, and we think that's, that's kind of where the most educational, interesting things are going to happen. So we start seeing these lines crossing where you can hopefully get the general public interacting with kids and youth and with doctors in a sort of collaborative kind of environment. And to me, this is really kind of where the holy grail of educational game design, one of them, I guess there's a, quite a few of them, but one of them is trying to create games that really break down these walls that we have in education, thank you, that have historically been a big kind of part of the problem. So how do we then start to turn and think about assessing learning? Um, well, um, I don't want to bore you with, with intro to psychometric theory, but if you don't know it, this is kind of the basic uh, way that we think about starting psychometrics, right? So you start with some sort of observation, right? And in, in most cases, this is something like a test, right? That's considered an observation of a performance. Um, you've got some sort of underlying model of cognition. Now, one of the issues that we've got is that most of our kind of tests were based on this very outdated model that um, all we do is memorize things. And, and you know, the faster someone goes through something means the faster that they're processing it. And that was kind of the interpretive framework around the, the mind as a um, uh, you know, kind of simple computer sort of thing. Um, and um, you might think about something as a very traditional, again, you, your, your models, you've got this test, and doctors are the experts who've got all the information in their head, and then your desire is to make the person kind of who's this computer get it in there as fast as possible. That's kind of how we've been, unfortunately, taught to think about assessment. Um, but you know, as we know, that's not really at all how, how people uh, think and learn. You know, there's a whole body of literature on, on doctors and surgeons about professional judgment, being able to see, and seeing things differently is really important. There's, of course, eye to, eye to hand skills, or even just that self-efficacy problem. Like, do you see yourself as the kind of person who could go on and kind of become a doctor? Um, so again, this is kind of the underlying model that we, we've 
kind of um, uh, inherited. You know, expertise is just regurgitating back the stuff you're supposed to know. Um, but the underlying model that we have is that learning is really fundamentally about solving problems and participating in complex practices, right? Everywhere outside of school, that's what you're doing. You're trying to solve problems. You're trying to interact with actual people and doing things. Um, learning is engaged action where you want, you know, you, this engage is, I think, an important word. Where learning is about being committed and, and being there and wanting to do something. Usually there's um, some link between your identity and what your goals are and aspirations. And then in terms of expertise, it's oftentimes distributed. So um, this is um, what we call the sequestering problem in, in um, assessment. So there's this real problem where we normally say, all right, we're going to lock you in a room with a pencil, you know, number two pencil. You're not allowed to talk to anyone, do anything. You know, it's kind of like you know, the sequestered jury. Um, you never do that anywhere else outside of assessment situations, right? In the real world, you, a smart person knows how to um, uh, IM their friends, look things up in books, and so on and so on. So. Um, what we're imagining is a different kind of a model where you are trying to use things like games to create context of engaged action. You are then looking at, through things like online character sheets, looking at what kinds of problem solving they do, how they participate in complex practices, and then giving them access to different communities, thank you, where they actually get a chance to um, interact with people. So um, uh, th that's how we kind of see this, this sort of uh, model working. So how do we actually do this? Well, we're still in the, the infancy because you, know, you have to have some decent games going, but there's kind of uh, three different ways that we think about it. First are things like technical achievements. So in game systems, it's very, this is my, uh, Character sheet, as a few of you people know back there. This is my uh, druid who I've kind of let go in World of Warcraft. But um, if you look at games, one thing that's very obvious and simple to do is you can just simply track what they've done, right? And you can have access to that information. You can then also provide records of decisions. So what kinds of decisions have they made? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then last, things like peer ratings, which I think is one of the areas that the games and assessment community has not fully exploited that I want to talk a little bit more about. So you might think about what kinds of things did they do in the game? What kinds of choices did they make? And how did others kind of view their work? Um, so here, let's go. So this is another sort of uh, one from StarCraft. As you see, there are many different models actually floating out there in games already. Um, that, where you can, you can actually look at what kinds of things they've done. Now, in terms of looking at uh, choices that are made, um, there's a body of literature coming from Dan Schwartz at Stanford that looks at one way to look at learning is what kind of choices they make. And game designers can, in some situations, create things that are checkpoints where you actually get to see what they're doing. So this is one of the conversations from Citizen Science. It's a game where you are role playing as a kid who's trying to save Lake Mendota. It's a lake in Madison. And one thing that we've done is we've, um, through watching people play and through looking at the existing research, we found that there are common kinds of mistakes that people make. There's common mistakes that they make in terms of judging evidence. And we've seated those in the game at specific points. And we can then hopefully look and see where they're getting caught up and where they're not. Um, how, so um, things that we can then track are what evidence they choose for their arguments, uh, what kind of characters do they talk to, are there differences in how experts play versus novices. Um, and then do they make different choices after playing? So if you've played once and then you play a new level, can we start to see a difference between them? And then we can infer that there's actually a difference. Um, I think one of the interesting things is, again, if you step back and look at how games are doing this right now, um, this is um, a screenshot from um, a healing uh, mod from World of Warcraft. And I think what's really interesting is that in authentic context, one thing game players do is that they get this data, right? They look at it, particularly in, in things like raids, and then they have giant arguments over what constitutes good performance. What is, um, uh, and, and, and in a game like this, it's perfectly normal for you to say, well, here's what I'm going for. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Then I use data in service of making an argument about my performance. And then, of course, an assessment is your dream, right? You want a kid to stand up and say, well, here's my five test scores. Here's the data on how I did. Here's what I'm trying to do. I knew that this content was a little harder for me. I'm a little undergeared, so to speak. But here's how I think I'm doing. And you want that ownership to eventually go to the student. Um, again, performance data is used for formative feedback all the time in games. And our education games, I don't think, have done a particularly good job of it. Um, one of the, the, again, you know you would be winning is if you had kids building their own models. This is a uh, player built model in World of Warcraft. But players building models to try to test their own understandings would, would be great. Um, the last thing I want to wrap up on is this idea that assessment is fundamentally social, right? Part of what we do with assessment is make decisions about people. We have different um, constituencies making claims about people. And we imagine something happening where you could have something like a character sheet. I, I just made this in my hotel room, but it gives you a sense of where you could go with it. That, so let's say I'm a level 19, age 18 American female. Email, and you could have things like ratings from the physicians of, uh, who looked at the cases that I solved and said, oh, you know, Kurt's really great to collaborate with. 
Um, and he's not so good at giving feedback, but he's pretty persistent. Um, then you can have things like composite scores where all of his friends, if you add up all of their ratings of him, um, and then different communities saying doctors in general think he's good, the you know, biologists don't care for him so much. Um, you can imagine tracking time played, what their scores are, social network maps, who they know around the world. Um, these are all things that we could be doing, and this is kind of the next steps that we're going to be taking. We're going to be working across our games, and others are welcome to join if they're interested, to try to build these sort of kind of character sheets, if you will, around what people know and learn. And you can imagine this um, hopefully being far preferential to something like a GRE score, especially if you've got already saying, you know, groups of people like doctors and professional researchers saying, yes, this person's good. Um, we think that's a much more persuasive form of evidence than what we currently do. So um, just to wrap up, so some of the things we think about then, which are very different, are that these are games and things that are intentionally cross-institutional, right? So if you're just in a school in our world, then that's not what we want. We want it to be people all, all across different walks of life. And in terms of working in this building, we want people to feel like they're a part of it, to kind of breaking down these, these walls, and then um, hopefully you know, monitoring their own kind of learning within it. Um, in terms of our own games, we think very much about these continua going from safe sandbox kinds of things like a one-player game toward authentic participation, and then going from things we are consuming toward producing. Um, you know, um, you know, we generally are oftentimes in this bottom left quadrant trying to get you towards upper right. Not all every student will do that in every every scenario, but that's kind of our, our vision for where we want to go. So that's the um, kind of the, the overall vision. These are my colleagues, and I think we're not we're going to do questions afterwards, right? So I'll hand off to. Speaker there, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Do you need this? Our next speaker is Seth Cooper. Uh, Seth Cooper is a graduate student at the University of Washington. He is co-creator and architect of Foldit, uh, along with Zoran Popovic. Uh, he has the unique distinction, well, the almost, actually the not so unique distinction of being uh, one of the primary authors on an article in Nature that had 75,000 co-authors. Uh, I'll leave that for another day, that story. It's very interesting. Uh, I think today, what, what Seth and Zorn have been doing at the Center for Game Science at University of Washington is looking at new ways to embed formative assessment uh, inside of educational games, among other types of games, and also to find ways to, uh, uh, to allow educators to actually tweak the difficulty of the game uh, within, within game mechanics, which is not a simple task. Uh, and I will, I think he's set up here, so I'll stop there and uh, let's let Seth take it over. Cheers. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm coming from the Center for Game Science, which is um, in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Washington. And just a little bit of information about this center um, where, where I'm working at. It's newly formed at the University of Washington, just started um, earlier this year. And the sort of the core central goal and mission that we have at the center is to use video games to try to solve a lot of the hard problems that um, are facing us in the world and facing humanity. And the general approach that we're going to take to try to solve these problems is to essentially to combine uh, the approaches of science as well as game design to try to um, leverage the benefits that both of these kinds of approaches can take. At the center, we have a, a team that is growing quite rapidly. We have about 30 people now, which consists of graduate students as well as undergraduate students, uh, developers, game designers, and artists all working together to create a lot of really uh, well-produced and high-quality games. And we're also working together with um, a lot of people who are sort of world-class in their particular fields, such as some of the game designers we're working with have come from Bungie. Um, we're working with learning scientists such as John, John Bransford and biochemists like David Baker, who are really the, the world experts in their, their particular fields. But the challenge that we're facing is, first of all, it's really hard, as we know, to make an entertaining game. Even if you have no constraints on the game design at all, just making a game that's fun and engaging and that people want to play is still a very difficult problem that no one really has solved. And it's even harder to do this if you have some kind of constraints on your game design uh, that you actually want to use the game to solve a real problem, whether you're interested in doing real biochemistry or you actually want the people who are playing the game to learn something. This places like enormous constraints on the type of games that you can actually uh, create and on the kinds of games that you can design and the space that you can explore. So we can't really separate these two objectives. We really have to try to meet both of them at the same time. 
So one of the games that we have developed at the center is, uh, is called Folded. And the goal of Folded is to try to combine human spatial reasoning and problem solving ability with computational power to solve this really difficult problem in biochemistry, which is the protein folding problem. And that problem is essentially given a particular protein, you want to determine how it will actually end up folding up in nature, which is a really difficult problem, whether this is whether you try to solve it experimentally or by throwing more and more computation at it. So we thought it would be a good candidate for making it into a game so that we could have human spatial reasoning and problem solving to try to augment current methods for solving this problem. This is a joint project between uh, the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Washington and the Department of Computer, Computer Science. And in general, Folded is an online game where players are competing to actually fold up proteins better than the other people who are playing. And they're working on real scientific problems that we work with the biochemists to put into the game. The game has been out for about three years, and it's been played by over 100,000 people at this point. And one of the things that we found that was very interesting early on with Foldit is that we didn't actually design Foldit to be used as an educational tool. We wanted to teach people how to fold proteins so that they could play the game, but not necessarily um, you know, teach them a lot of background about biochemistry. But what we found was that teachers actually began doing things like assigning playing Folded as homework for their classes, or actually requesting for us to post uh, particular structures that they were interested in or that they were studying into the game so that their students could actually interact with the structures directly. And um, so here's an example. We had a, a, a puzzle that was posted specifically for a biochemistry class that was requested of us. And it's also started to show up in some textbooks in sort of the multimedia sections um, to be an example of how, um, you know, people can learn about biochemistry in this interactive way. So we're, really, we're just starting to look into how Folded as a game is being used for education, both formal and informal learning environments. But just some of the thoughts about what we've done in Folded that have helped to benefit uh, this sort of, uh, this approach of using it for education are, first of all, we really wanted to just get to the core problem because problem solving is really fun for people, right? They like, you know, people like to be presented with problems and figuring out how to sort of tinker around with them and be able to solve them. So we wanted to really distill biochemistry down to this core problem solving that people could get to right away. Uh, we also wanted to let players know what they're working on so they would know that they had this real connection to the science and the biochemistry that's being working on, and that's very motivating. And we also wanted to abstract away a lot of the details and maybe some of the more boring things that you might have to get through in a textbook so that players could get right to um, the sort of the more interesting part that they wanted to get to. But we do actually give players access to the, uh, the details if they want it so they can actually grow and learn uh, um, on their own pace. And so just an example of one of the things that we did with abstraction is this example is sort of the visualization in Foldit. Um, on the left side is one of the sort of standard biochemistry visualizations. There are a lot of atoms in the protein and there's a lot going on. It's hard to see what's actually happening. And we took that and we kind of tried to distill it down to just the information that the players needed to be able to fold the protein well. And so we ended up with this sort of visualization on the left that hides a lot of the, the unnecessary details of the protein and sort of tries to let the players see more of the structure and what's going on at a higher level. Another really key thing to our approach with Folded was that we decided early on to iterate and experiment with the game. We assumed that we weren't going to be able to get it right the first time. So we we wanted to be able to iterate and expand the game after we released it. So what we did was we performed the design of the game as an experiment, where we're essentially observing what the players are doing, observing what kinds of results they're coming up with, observing what kinds of uh, parts of the game they like to use, and we can then adjust the game appropriately to, uh, to kind of augment the places where they're good or kind of try to fix up the places where the players aren't doing as well as we want. And in this way, the game is able to evolve continually as the players do. So the game was, of course, created with an iterative feedback loop, not only with the players and the development team, as most games would be, but we also had a really tight feedback loop with the scientists who helped out with Foldit um, to sort of evaluate prototypes, look at player uh, results as they, as they created them to kind of improve the game. So for example, we have a set of introductory levels that are meant to teach players how to play Foldit, and we're continually gathering data on how the players are getting through these levels, how far they progress through the levels, um, how well they do. And so as we introduce changes to these introductory levels that are meant to teach the gameplay of Foldit to the players, we can observe how well the players do and what the impact of each individual change that we make over time is to try to continually improve the experience of the players while they're playing Foldit. 
Another really important part of the development of the expertise and education of the players in Foldit is to develop the community expertise, which I, we heard a little bit about at the, uh, in the last talk, because the players are all playing together, they're working together, they're communicating with each other all the time. And we really want to take the players from not knowing anything about biochemistry or how to fold proteins to being an expert. And the community is really important for this because we can't really cover everything in the introductory levels. It's also important as a community to keep the players engaged and involved for a long period of time. We actually want the players to be around long enough to learn enough about protein folding and how to play the game to be able to make a contribution. So we have a lot of support for community, collaboration, competition, and other kinds of social elements within the game. We have chat in the game and forums. There's leaderboards where the players can compete against each other. And there are also um, groups so the players can work together. One thing that we actually observed early on, too, after releasing the game was that the players created their own wiki without any help um, or involvement from us. They created their own wiki where they could discuss sort of their different strategies, their thoughts about how to fold proteins. Um, they created their own terminology for things that we didn't give them names for. And so we wanted to further support this in-game. We added this uh, tool, which we called the cookbook, that allows the players to write, run, share, modify their own uh, protein folding strategies. And so players are really taking advantage of this to kind of codify the expertise and strategy that they've developed and share it with other players. So of course, in the end, we wanted to know if this kind of approach was useful for being able to develop players who didn't necessarily know anything about protein folding to the point where they would be able to make an interesting contribution and solve these kinds of scientific problems. And so what we found out was that, yes, um, we did, we did a, uh, an evaluation where we found that the players were actually able to fold particular proteins. Um, they could actually make major structural rearrangements to the proteins uh, to go from incorrectly folded proteins to correctly folded ones, even where computational methods would fail and get stuck in local minima. So this was a really exciting sort of validation and evaluation results for Foldit, which, uh, as was mentioned, resulted in the first Nature publication that I know of that had <laughs> over 50,000 authors on it. I also wanted to give a quick plug for a demo that we have this afternoon with Foldit combined with Connect. We actually want to be able to uh, augment Foldit to take advantage not just of human mind and problem solving ability, but also uh, the human hands and the ability to sort of shape and mold things. So we are, are working to integrate Connect with Foldit to allow players to sort of reach in and directly manipulate the proteins that they're working with. So in a sense, what we've done with Foldit is we've created this system for co-evolution of both taking uh, people from being not experts in a particular area, in this case biochemistry, to sort of becoming their own particular type of expert in, in this area, as well as for taking the program or the game that they're using to some sort of optimal problem-solving tool that is best adapted to how they want to solve the problem. So our goal is to bring, uh, both bring people up to a very high level of expertise and also optimize the game as a tool for solving a problem. And games are a really ideal vehicle for this kind of co-adaptation because they're motivating, they get players involved, they're a, they're a great you know, sort of arena for problem solving. And there's this great social aspect where the players interact and compete and collaborate with each other. So uh, in that sense, we, w we were curious if we would be able to apply this kind of co-evolution approach that we had seen worked with Folded in games towards improving education. And to sort of determine what a good place to try this approach was, we're sort of looking at early math education. And we're interested in early math education because this is one of the key bottlenecks for actually all math education. Um, if you look at kids who are interested in math and science, there are a lot of them in elementary school, but there's sort of this area, uh, this time in middle school where kids kind of lose interest in math and science. And then when you end up with the people who actually become professionals in math and science, you have a much smaller number. Um, so we want to reach the kids early on when they're learning fractions because this is one of the key bottlenecks to later involvement in math and education um, and education of math in high school. So we want to have an early established base of math for the kids. But one of the problems is when you're looking at how to teach kids fractions, everyone sort of has their own ideas about what is the best way to teach fractions, but no one really knows what is the best way. Um, the current research is kind of based on studies that have limited sample sizes, and a lot of people disagree. So even if you want to look at something as simple as, what's the best way to visually represent a fraction? Should we use a length? Should we use like a pizza? Or should we use you know, cookies? And some of them are eaten. Uh, people disagree on this. And so it's hard to decide where to begin teaching. 
And in fact, in the field of math and, and fraction education, there's sort of this crisis of evidence where there are lots of uh, other fields are drowning in data, but actually educational research, there really isn't uh, massive amounts of data to be able to support the things that you might want to know, such as um, what are the best instructional practices to follow and what are the learning processes that students take. So if we, we decided that if we wanted to make an effective game to teach fractions, we were going to need to find the optimal pathways for student learning uh, to actually teach them fractions, as well as we'd like to know what are student-specific adaptations that we can make to help each individual student uh, have a tailored experience to help them learn about fractions. So what we decided was that rather than just starting and trying to make games for learning based on uh, um, sort of existing um, educational research, what we really wanted to come up with was games for massive data gathering to try to optimize the learning pathways that students take so that we could actually try to leverage massive amounts of data to figure out what are the best ways to teach fractions to students. And our approach is, is, uh, is not unlike uh, ones that are taken by companies like Amazon. For example, if you go to an Amazon web page, oftentimes different people will get a different web page that um, when, they visit the, when they visit Amazon, and it's not due to your personal preferences, but it's because Amazon is actually carrying out these large-scale experiments where everyone gets a slightly different web page, maybe with um, you know, the buy button in a different place, and then what they can do is they can look at who buys more stuff, and that, that web page is basically becomes the main web page that most people get. So we can take this similar approach and try to apply this to kinds of educational pathways that students might have. For example, if we have some idea of maybe an ordering of concepts or levels in an educational game that we want to use to teach students something, we can actually take the starting sort of ordering of concepts, make some adjustments to it, maybe switch two concepts or two levels, maybe introduce a new concept that someone thinks is also important to learn, and then we can give each one of these different uh, sort of concept orderings to a large group of students, see which one actually causes the students to perform the best, potentially with embedded assessments inside the game. And if it's this one here, then that sort of layout can then become the base model that we use for teaching this concept within the game. And we can repeat and iterate and refine in that way, uh, continually improving the educational process that's embedded inside the game. So in order to carry out this kind of adaptive game-based uh, massive data gathering, we're working on creating an online game world that we want to be able to make accessible to any children with a web browser so that we can gather lots of data from many different students all over the world. We're working with uh, the K-12 Virtual Academies, which is a company that distributes sort of um, learning materials to students and also uh, public uh, school systems in Washington and Texas to try to get access and to uh, you know, tens of thousands of students so we can gather lots and lots of data to refine these kinds of educational pathways within the game. The first game that we've developed is called Refraction. And this is a puzzle-solving puzzle game which involves uh, fractions and spatial logic where the students have, uh, when you play the game, you have lasers coming out of emitters. And you have to use pieces of um, sort of mirrors to either reflect the lasers or split the lasers up into fractional parts. And you have to get the correct amount of uh, fractional laser to spaceships to power them up. And you free cute, uh, cute aliens that you can then collect and, and keep in your collection. So the students have to solve a spatial problem, but also a fractional problem and able to complete the level, in order to complete the level. And uh, the refraction actually recently won the grand prize in the Disney Learning Challenge at SIGGRAPH last year. And uh, this has actually been online. And there have been you know, 200,000 people have played the game on Congregate, which is a, a very popular Flash site. So the game is fun and engaging as well. So with this online world that we want to create and, and fill with, uh, with online games, we want to try to use this approach to answer questions like, which pathways do kids take to learn? What is the correct partial ordering of concepts that should follow each other in order to, uh, to help children best learn these concepts? Can we modify the game well for a specific subset of students? Are there particular subsets of students who um, you know, different orderings of concepts might work better for than others? What's the best thing to do at a specific point of confusion? If we have all this data and we see someone being confused, maybe we've seen someone else who was confused at that same point before, 
and we can figure out if the, how they got past that confusion and use that data to sort of drive this kind of system. And what's the best level to present at any point? Is, can, we, can we observe how a student is progressing through the levels and see how other students have done and use this, this mass amount of data that we can gather to try to adjust and customize the progression through the levels for an individual student. So automatic analysis and, and uh, all this data that we can gather is useful, but is there a way that, uh, that we can take all this data and present it to the designers and the educators so that they can um, see patterns in all of this massive high dimensional data that we've gathered? So we're developing some, uh, some visual data analytics tools that we can use for uh, educators and learning scientists to help them sort of see kind of high level patterns and how people play the games and how people progress through the levels. So in the case of refraction, uh, we can look at how players progress through the levels. Each sort of positioning of the pieces on the board you can think of as a state in the game. And you start at a particular uh, starting state, which here is represented as the yellow circle, and you want to progress to the green circle, which is the goal. And what we can do is we can look at this high-level aggregate data of all the players who play the game and how they progress through the state space of the game. And the tool we developed to do this is called Play Tracer. And so, for example, we can see um, each of these circles would be a state in the game that players have visited. And there's the start state and the goal state. And then there are all the other states that the players might have visited in, as they played through the game, which we can get out of mining the data. And then you can also observe the paths that the players take through the state space to reach the goal. Or perhaps, if they don't ever reach the goal, maybe they reach a point of confusion that you can see as they move away from the goal and they get kind of lost. And this might be a point where you would want to come in and help the players and try to point them in the right direction of the goal or help them overcome the particular confusion that they've come up with. And so the idea is to take all of this data and come up with a way that you can just sort of at a glance see what are the particular interesting features of how the players are exploring the space of this educational game. So this is an example of Play Tracer that was run on uh, real refraction data. And so there's a starting there's the big yellow starting state there and the green goal state off on the side and all the other states that the players visited. Here, size is actually relative to how many players ended up visiting that state. And so we can look at this state, which seems like a relatively popular state, to visit um, right out of the start from the, the starting state, but it actually sort of moves them away from the goal. So we can actually go back in and we can look at what this state looks like in the game. And we can see that what this state represents is the player kind of took this, uh, this splitter that split the laser in half and put it down all the way in the corner where they're kind of stuck. It's kind of a greedy approach. And they, they couldn't actually progress any further through the level because all the rest of the laser was kind of going off the screen. And so this is kind of, we can look at this and say, well, you know, the student seems to be confused. So what are some of the ways that we might be able to improve this? And in particular, we kind of thought that you know, that because this, uh, the emitter for the laser is kind of down in the corner, that, that seems kind of cramped. And so we actually took this level and we sort of re-architected it to make them more open and there be more space. And we found that the players were actually able to progress through this level better. So in this case, it seemed to be more of a problem with the spatial layout of the level than the fractional actually part in it. Uh, something else that we're interested in is actually automatically turning textbooks into games. and uh, for, for example, taking the problems in the problem set in the textbook and automatically turning them into game levels or multiple uh, levels that the players would have to complete, complete, which would be taking the place of sort of the standard homework problem set. Instead of just doing a bunch of problems in a workbook, you could imagine automatically scanning the problem set, turning all those problems into game levels, and then the, the student's homework becomes um, actually playing the set of levels that in order to complete the levels, they have to actually solve the same fractional problems that they would have had to solve in, in the, the problem set. So we have this uh, system now that you can give a fractional equation, and it will create a level in refraction that requires you to solve that particular fractional problem in order to complete the level. So this was a really simple one, 1 half plus 1 fourth. There are a bunch of other knobs that you can adjust that include adjusting the actual spatial difficulty in the level. So this is the exact same problem, a fractional problem that the player has to solve to complete this level, but it becomes a lot more difficult because there are you know, asteroids that the player has to go around 
there are a bunch of kind of decoy pieces that the player has to think about using um, rather than just giving them the exact right set of pieces to solve the level. And then you can also embed more than one particular equation in the same level. And you can come up with really complicated levels that are, are difficult to solve um, <coughs> spatially as well. Uh, so another interesting thing that we'd like to, to actually allow is to have this kind of parent and teacher portal, which will allow them to track student progress. So if we have this kind of assessment in the game, we can see how the players are doing on a bunch of different particular sub-skills within the area of fractions and their learning and their progress on each of these topics. And parents or teachers perhaps could have a way of coming in, looking at how well the students are doing, but not only seeing uh, how well the students are doing in particular uh, topics, but actually being able to adjust the game's focus to focus on different uh, topics that the, the teacher or parent might think are more important. So if the teacher is going to be talking about maybe fraction addition or some other topic over the next week, they can adjust the, um, the knobs within the game that will cause it to generate more levels that have that kind of problem solving within them. So when the students come to class, they'll be more familiar with that topic and more prepared. So in conclusion, we're interested in making these kinds of fun and engaging games that will allow us to get ma access to massive amounts of data that we can use to kind of um, try to find the optimal learning pathways and, and customizations for particular students to use this data to kind of answer some key questions in education that have been uh, difficult to answer up to this point by using these games that are continually adapting, trying to optimize for the students um, as they learn and using the data that we gather to kind of continually adapt the game and optimize it for pathways for bringing the students from novices in fractions to experts in fractions, as we've been trying to do with Foldit for the past several years. And if you'd like, both of the games, Foldit and Refraction, are available online. So you can uh, visit these two URLs if you'd like to try to play the games. Um, and or here's my contact information as well. So, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, my next speaker, our last speaker for this session is Tracy Fullerton. Uh, she is the director of the uh, uh, interactive, uh, the innovation lab at, at the uh, innovation and games lab at, at uh, University of Southern California. Uh, in the in the cinema school, she is the endowed the electronic arts endowed chair for interactive entertainment there. Uh, she is uh, she's won faculty advisor awards for uh, for some wonderful award winning student games. She's a very inspirational person who never ceases to amaze me every time I speak with her. I'm very much looking forward to her talk, and not only because I understand that I'm featured in it, uh, hopefully in a positive light. We'll see, uh, and. Uh, well, she's setting up, so what else can I say about Tracy? I think we're good. You're good? You're good to start? All right. Um, PC2, I think, is what we're on. All right, let's see what happens here. Oh. Do we have? You have to do this. Oh. What? Are you on PC? Interesting. This never happens. Hang on, oh, that should go. Okay. All right, great. Okay, um, so it's uh, a bit of an inflammatory title. I don't know that I'll live up to it, but since this is a talk that is um, uh, about a little bit of, I guess, tribal conflicts, if you will, um, it's only fair that I should identify my tribe. Um, I'm a game designer. Um, uh, before I was an academic, I was a commercial game designer, um, and I've worked on many types of, of products uh, from early Laserdisc cinematic games to theme park interactives uh, to art games um, to interactive television um, to some of the earliest <coughs> multiplayer social games uh, on the web. And I've worked on a lot of really difficult problems, including technical problems, creative problems, business problems, um, pretty much the gamut, you name it, 
And my feeling has always been problems are fun. Um, problems are, are um, what make the work interesting. So I don't mind that. Um, but the problem of how to use games for learning um, is a particularly tough task. It's a wicked problem. I have to admit, um, after several years working in it, I I'm not entirely certain that it's always fun. Um, and there are a few obvious reasons for this, um, some of which have already been brought up. So I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that um, I'm the, the last speaker. One of the big problems is the notion of learning itself, um, what we think it is, where we think it happens, um, how we think it happens, and how we measure it. Uh, I'm not actually going to go into this because uh, Kurt already uh, really eloquent gave us a 101 on that. Um, but I will say that um, the landscape of learning, the places where learning is supposed to be uh, occurring, have not really changed very much in the last 100 years. Um, you know, if, if games had, uh, I mean, if school had been a game franchise, um, there really never would have been a sequel, right? Um, but even if our system is not perfect, we have expectations for it, very high expectations, and we want to know if and how it's working, and that's where assessment comes in. So here is actually what I think is a very clear, usable definition um, from Val Schutte um, at uh, University of Florida, who um, sets a reasonably high expectation for what we should be looking at in an assessment of learning. It's common sense, really. Um, we should be able to trust the information we get about learning because it's reliable, it's contextualized, and, and we should be able to use it to improve learning. But the reality of, of, of assessment isn't this. Um, where we are with traditional assessment um, is really that we have validity issues, right? So the measurements, of, as we've already seen, are not occurring in meaningful context. Um, it's uh, not keeping pace with the kinds of skills that we need uh, for the 21st century. Uh, and it rarely influences uh, instruction or learning um, uh, in the place where the, the assessment is taken. So you have learning, supposedly you, have, you stop learning, you take a test. Uh, where that information goes, we don't know, but it doesn't go back into the place where uh, the assessment was taken. So right now there's a lot of interest and pressure. Um, we've already seen um, some examples uh, to develop learning tools like games that address these issues. And it's a really wonderful goal. And like most wonderful goals, it is not simple to achieve. Um, and I want to talk about a couple examples of design processes. Since I am a designer, um, I, I'm going to talk about them from a designer point of view. And these are anecdotal, um, but I think they're illustrative. Um, so this is actually a picture of one of my grad students working on a game to teach pre-algebra concepts, actually fractions. Um, he's working with uh, a team of content uh, experts, uh, including math teachers and psychologists uh, and assessment experts. Um, and I'm not going to name any of these folks because I really like them. And I'm, 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 I'm going to poke a little bit of fun at them. Um, the game went through about six months of excruciating brainstorming. I'm exaggerating, but no, I'm not really. Um, early on, there were ideas for adventures and puzzles and interesting, clever fun. But every idea like that was shut down with statements like, but we don't want them to be able to make mistakes. Um, or our concern is, um, if they're having fun jumping, will they care about the math? Um, and I have to say, I like these people. They're good people. Um, they're good-hearted, well-meaning, um, but they were used to delivering information, um, not creating environments for learning. And every kind of word out of their mouths really, even though it might have been another word, it was shaped like the word no. And towards the end, I came into a design meeting, and I found this on the screen. Um, and everyone was nodding their heads. And I had to be the bad cop, and I had to say, <laughs> Listen, people, this is not a game. You have designed a worksheet on a computer. So you know, we all went back to the drawing board. Um, and I realized at some point that these folks had never been in a design process. That wasn't their job, and they really shouldn't be held accountable for that. Um, they didn't have any game literacy. They actually didn't know why jumping was fun. We had to show them why jumping was fun. Um, most importantly, you know, they'd never played this game called Yes And. Some of you have probably used this in variations uh, in your own work. Um, the idea is that before you speak in a brainstorm, you have to preface everything you say with yes and, right? Um, it's amazing how hard it is to do this, by the way. We're so used to interrupting each other with saying things like but or or and injecting our own opinion. Yes uh, is critical to good collaboration. Every time um, 
You say it, you affirm the person who spoke before you, right? Even if you don't agree with them, you affirm them. And hopefully, if you do even subtly agree with them, you build on what they say. Um, and so in, in teams that are multidisciplinary, yes and is critical. So one of the other things that didn't happen was we never actually brought any kids in. Because for assessment folks, whenever we would ask to um, get kids involved, they'd say, oh, well, we've already done a pretest. We're just waiting for the thing so we can do a post test. Um, and we'd say, well, but we'd really like to have the kids' you know, opinion on what we're doing. It was a really interesting disconnect um, between how assessment people see children and how designers see children. So I'm going to jump to another example. Um, this one we started with kids. Um, we started with partners uh, at, at USC in the education department who run a summer program um, helping kids prepare for college, um, specifically high school kids in underserved areas um, who would be the first generation of kids in their, uh, in their family uh, to attend college if they're able to make it through the gauntlet of the application process. Um, so we want to find out uh, you know, what confused these kids about the process um, and help them ask the right questions and um, develop strategies and plan financially. Um, and you know high school kids, they don't want to ask you anything if they don't have to, right? Um, so we went to look at what the information that was available to them already was. Uh, you know, there was lots of websites and pamphlets and, and even some games. Most of them are about prepping for the SAT, which is funny because it's usually a game that's sort of like a test that helps you prep for a test. Um, and you can tell that that would be really fun. Um, so um, with our junior design team, we actually deputized them. Um, uh, with our junior design team, we actually prototyped uh, a, a game that poked some fun at the whole process. Um, and gave them a chance to ask those questions, the ones that were troubling them, that they were afraid to ask, but without the pressure of real world consequences. Um, uh, it's a social game played in groups of three to four. And by the end of the round, um, some of the characters in the game, so each, each kid plays a character who's trying to get into college, and some of the characters will have gotten into great schools. And they will have found a way to finance their studies and done well in the schools. Maybe they became a connected alumni or they um, uh, became a published author um, while they were in school. Others wind up in their second choice schools or safety schools. And some kids actually play collaboratively, um, trying to get their characters in the same school so they can go together. Um, and ultimately, though, they compete for money and slots in the very selective schools. Um, and as they play, what we saw was that they assessed their own choices, saying things like, well, I should have focused more on one activity um, rather than you know, taking on a ton of different activities in school. Um, if I'd focused more, say, on debate club, I could have got a letter from, from uh, the uh, uh, advisor, um, and it would have been a better letter. Next time I'm going to do that, I'm going to try to get into a private school because I think I could have gotten in. And by the time they're done playing one round of the game, they know what questions to ask their counselors. Uh, but my favorite thing is actually watching a group of kids who played one round of the game teach another group of kids how to play the game, right? Because then they own that knowledge. Um, they're explaining to other kids what kind of activities are better. Like, why should you, um, you know, join the Model UN uh, um, rather than do Ultimate Frisbee, right? Nothing wrong with Ultimate Frisbee, though. Um, but basically, they own that knowledge, and they um, uh, begin to discuss it amongst each other. And it's not a power struggle like it is um, if any of you have kids, you know, you try to talk to them and say, um, oh, well, what do you think you, 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 call, what, what do you, what do you, think you want to do? Nothing. Nothing, I don't, you know. But now these, now they're owning this themselves and they're discussing among themselves. But this is really nothing new, right? So, game designers um, understand this this idea of meta assessment. I'm going to let one of the great ones talk about it. Well, I think one of the things that you know just first comes to mind is the idea that assessment is somehow a separate process. You know, which in game design that's very much not the case. Uh, you know, basically assessment is continual, it's granular. Uh, and it's something that's very visible to the player. Um, you know, in a game, somebody's actually learning many different levels at once. You know, some of these interaction loops. You know, over the first few seconds, you're pressing the button and observing what happens. Your character might move around. You're learning how to control the character. You know, that's a you know, maybe five-second interaction loop. You know, it has its own form of kind of you know success and failure. Uh, after you kind of master that, the next level is you know how do I get you know past the evil guards or through the door or whatever that is. And that might be a one or two minute. Kind of interaction loop, you know, and these are all embedded in each other, and they're all continual. You know, the player has a very good sense of I've mastered this level, now I'm on to that level. Uh, and so, I think you know, assessment in game design really is the activity. 
you know, it's continual, granular, and very visible. So that was Will Wright, and um, this was part of a conversation that was held at um, the Games Learning and Assessment Workshop that we had at USC at the beginning of this year, um, which was um, funded by the Gates Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. Um, some of you actually attended, which is great. We really love that. Um, the goal of the workshop was to start a conversation between these various tribes, right, that I was um, alluding to. Um, these groups of people, uh, uh, educators, learning assessment experts, game designers, and game user researchers. Um, and we had participants from major game companies, um, uh, from small indie developers, and from uh, education and assessment. And we spent a day and a half um, really trying to uh, begin this conversation. And um, just to be clear, I want to talk about these four groups. So game designers design and develop games, right? They create environments for play. They often work very closely with game user researchers um, who are um, tasked with assessing how users engage with their games and helping them iterate and improve on the experience. Um, it's really science in the service of play. Um, educators, in the best case scenario, are creating environments for learning, um, at least we hope they are, and learning assessment experts are assessing how well learning occurs in those environments, um, and in the best case scenario, that feedback would then go back in and also help iterate on those environments for play. Um, so if you're listening closely, you'll hear that there are really some clear echoes uh, across these practices that I think uh, are very interesting. And here's um, Katie Salen talking about those echoes. When a game designer um, thinks about designing an experience, the first thing that they're really thinking about is notions of engagement and interactivity. And we were on the phone and we, and we were talking about, well, how do we talk about assessment? It's about feedback, it's about data. And we'll say, well, yeah, but it's just interactivity. What, what we care about is how do we provide a choice for a player and then how do we provide feedback to them around that performance? So how am I doing? and providing a sense of, well, what can I do next? Right, so teachers are also thinking about that. They don't think about it as interactivity, right? They think about it as scaffolding a series of lessons. But it's the same process. You're trying to imagine, what is it that my student needs to know by the end of this experience? Game designers are thinking about, what is the experience that I want to create for my player? So they're thinking a lot about what we would call game mechanics or core mechanics. So what are the processes or methods that my player is going to use, what is that engaging thing that they're doing again and again that's going to give rise to a certain kind of experience that's going to get at that thing that I want them to be able to know and do. Right? So teachers think about the same thing. They often think a little bit more about it as a content piece and maybe less as a mechanic piece. Um, and so when we think about using games as assessment models, we actually do need to shift thinking a little bit away from kind of stuffing content into a game space and thinking more about well, what are the mechanics that are connected to that content that would provide uh, complex, interesting spaces for the players to begin to, to learn, to do and know the types of things that you eventually want them to be able to know and do. So one of the things I loved about what, what Katie says is um, that she does make that connection between the responsibilities and the goals of educators and those of game designers. And sometimes in order to be able to work with one another, we just have to believe that we're trying to do the same thing. Um, and so part of this dialogue was not only getting people um, in the room together, but we wanted to get these various types of individuals um, working together to practice that kind of uh, alignment, really, that kind of yes and experience. Um, and to surface both the issues and the potentials of these groups working together. And so our workshop focused on design within the workshop um, as uh, the core mechanic, if you will, of starting the dialogue. Um, and the task that we gave to the groups of people that we brought in um, was actually to create uh, game designs with embedded assessments in them. We gave them, oh, you know, a lot of time, really, um, a few hours on one day and then another kind of four hours on the second day. Um, so they should be able to do something by then, right? Um, <laughs> um, we started off, actually, the day with some fast brainstorming in groups um, that were not the main working groups. They were um, on purpose. We actually broke people up um, into informal groups um, to get everyone talking 
in a design vocabulary without the pressure of having to produce right away. Um, really what it is is priming the design process. Oops, that didn't go. There it went. Sure. So let's think of a verb. As a player, what am I going to do? Have to do that. That's the nature of it because in order for there to be good cards, there has to be bad cards. And if they said this is a great card, let's make them. So if it's, if it's my shirt, like retrieving it, like that in that sense, like that seems a little bit more. So maybe yeah. it's very good. Yeah. 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 Depends what your match is. Yeah. So the utility, yeah. if your match is very good, you're trying to be a lot. being aware, understanding consequences. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I should do a shout out to Mary Flanagan and say that we're using her um, Grow a Game cards in that exercise um, that uh, um, is just getting everyone talking there. Um, uh, after uh, the sort of priming uh, exercise, we broke off into nine groups, uh, each of them led by a content expert um, together with one of my grad students who could make sure that the group moved along quickly. Um, uh, brainstorming and prototyping their ideas. Um, in each group, we included a balance of professional game designers, uh, games user researchers, education experts, and assessment experts. And we tried to keep that balance um, so that there was you know, one, if not more, of, of each of the people from those groups uh, uh, in, each, in each section. So um, one note is the fourth uh, bullet there college knowledge um, was actually part of the same working group that um, developed that earlier example that I gave you. Um, but this time, the group included assessment experts from the beginning um, and took a focus on middle schoolers rather than, than high schoolers. Now, I only have a few minutes, and I'm, I've been bre you're just breezing through this so that um, we have time to get to questions at the end, yes. Um, but I do want to show this short video uh, that I've concatenated for some of the outcomes. Um, it was a very, very fast process, not meant to generate the end-all, be-all of designs, but rather to begin this process that I'm talking about, about learning each other's languages and integrating our goals. Um, so here's a few snippets from the video pitches that were made by each team at the end of the workshop. Um, these were supplemented by online design docs, which some teams filled out more than others. Uh, and which further articulated the gameplay um, and also the learning and assessment goals. And you're on. Okay, our game is designed to improve reading comprehension. What that means is we want to teach middle school students how to read like a detective. That is, extract the most possible information they can from dense texts. The game we came up with is called Alien Time Patrol. You're a time-traveling detective who's inv investigating crimes that aliens have perpetrated throughout history. The game board might look something like this. Um, the game consists of a series of cases. This first case, for instance, might be the Great Chicago Fire. Your secret time patrol organization knows that an alien actually caused the Chicago Fire. You have four suspects as to who the alien may have been. You have a series of texts that you are given that gives you the Hi, I'm Carl, and uh, I'm presenting for the pre-algebra group. Our game is called Potion Maker, where you play a, a quirky potion maker on some alien happy world where you travel from town to town solving the town's problems using ratios and proportional reasoning by taking... This is a game called Bad Dog. You're a, a new dog owner. You have a puppy. Uh, it has a series of behavioral problems that you need to be able to deal with uh, as you uh, try to negotiate the information landscape as to how to solve these problems, to filter who's credible and who's not credible based on things that you can observe about what they're doing. So for example, if your dog is barking and someone comes up with you with a barking dog and gives you advice about how to stop your dog barking, that's probably not the person to listen to. I'm going to propose a social action game. Bing! Now I'm going to get a few of my friends to help me design it. Bing! I have a play in class action. Since I have a camera heavy, handy, I'm going to earn some achievements. What did we design? An online game that allows tweens and teenagers to earn achievements by doing things. Some things are fun, like a flash song and dance. War! <laughs> Bing! Uh, some are easy, like wearing a t-shirt that advertises my favorite cause at school. Bing! Some are kind, like mentoring a fellow student. Hey man, can you help me with this? Oh yeah, no problem. Awesome, thanks. Bing! So, kind of edgy. Donald, thanks for being a good supporter about letting me show that. Um, <laughs> 
what was more important to me than the actual game ideas uh, and the, you know, their potential for moving forward, although I think some of them were actually kind of cool, um, was the exit interviews. So these are some of the things that people said uh, on the interview sheet that we asked them to fill out as they left. Um, uh, the, anecdotally, also, many, many people, especially in the education field, started to realize that there's a sense of um, need for them to have game literacy, um, not only just so that they can participate in the creation of learning games, but also because uh, game design is something that they can use in the creation of their own assignments uh, and making those even more engaging, even if you're not thinking of it as, as developing a digital game, for example. Um, so. Before I conclude, I want to say that the college card game um, I showed is actually launching as a commercial product next month. And the commercialization effort wa um, was funded by the Gilbert Foundation. Um, and revenue is going to go to support free copies to be given to counselors um, and groups working in, in underserved areas. Um, but uh, an online version will be developed, and that will be free. Um, that will be available early next year. And we announced last week that um, with funding from the Gates Foundation, we're going to begin working on both a middle school uh, game and a financial literacy game as part of the same suite of college knowledge activities. So that's something that came directly um, out of that um, collision of, of people. Um, I want to end with this quote from um, architect and theorist Chris Alexander, um, who in this quote is really, I think, talking about the difficulty of complex design problems. Um, and I think that games learning and assessment qualifies as one of those problems. Um, my feeling is that the cultural bridges between game designers, user researchers, educators, and assessment must be made before real progress can occur. And it's going to be difficult, but the, it has the potential to change our stagnant education system at its core. So it's important and meaningful. And who knows, if we do it right, it could even be fun. Thank you. And I just want to make a note there that we were actually deprived of sleep for 48 hours during that thing. <laughs> no, was, they were wonderful hosts, and it was an incredible experience working with Tracy. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I'd like to call our other two presenters up here, and we'll take a couple questions from the audience. We have an interesting conundrum that we have two microphones and three presenters. So, uh, I we'll, think I we'll saw be, the lab, too. So. You'll, we'll be creative with this, because I'm going to have to take this mic for whoever wants to ask a question. Uh, but yeah, why don't you guys come on up? And who wants to ask a question? There we go. You don't want me to ask questions. I have some really hard questions. So let's be kind to these folks. I have a very easy question. Uh, so when do you anticipate uh, some of these ideas using games to, to, uh, to substitute textbooks? When do you anticipate this may happen for an education system uh, here in this country or in other parts of the world? So I don't know if I'm getting the question right. Are you, are you asking when, like, when we think that sort of shift could happen in terms of taking textbooks? I don't know if it ever, I, I don't know. I mean, text, the textbook publishing, you know, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a beast of a weird industry, you know? It's a very much an, um, it's an oligopoly or whatever, where, you know, th three or four textbook companies dominate the industry. It's dominated by the large school districts. Um, my, my, I, I've kind of very much on principle decided that any time the more, I've spent about, I don't know, six, ten years trying to get into schools, and you end up doing all the things that were mentioned here where you start simplifying it, making it work within schools, then you realize, oh, well, I'm not going to transform schools because they were built around the technology of the textbook and they were built around the factory model and so on. So my, my belief is that you might, um, that, that we're probably best making things that are good and interesting learning environments <clears throat> than those who can't afford them and want to get them will. And then hopefully there'll be pu put pressures back on, um, on schools. But my more cynical view is that it's going to end up being that middle class parents supplement their children's um, education with these kinds of experiences. And then we stand around uh, debating whether or not they work by scientific methods. And then the, the poor schools and students never get them. And I think that's kind of the road we're on. Um, so um, I don't know, that's kind of my, I guess, more cynical view. And um, I, I guess the good news is that the textbook publishers that I, all, I work with all know that they're in trouble. They won't be probably in business five or 10 years from now doing what they do, you know, packaging this content that takes like 20 years to make, 
putting it in these you know book forms and then having kids that there's going to be disruptive devices which like i said that's my more hopeful view that if you're going to have to put something on the ipad or whatever the tablety thing that have we have in schools that um, it makes sense to be interactive i mean it's gonna be digital it makes more sense to be interactive pretty soon you're making games the assessment are going to be locked in and then maybe there's a chance that um, we could get some good stuff in that way but it's going to take some really interesting collaborations of the sort that that we were talking about. Um, that's my more hopeful view, I guess, and that there's the, the kinds of communities of the people in this room could hopefully make that happen. Uh, but again, I would start very much on purpose by not starting with schools um, because I think it's a, there's a lot of good reasons not to. Yeah, I mean, I just think, as I was sort of showing, we sort of started to work on some of that of like maybe some parts of the textbooks, like the problem sets and things, potentially making these into more game-like experiences for the students and I don't know how much of the rest of the textbook that can extend to but um, you know we've we sort of started working on some of that I think I think that you get covered it <laughs> Anyone else there? Oh, thank you. so I have a quick question about assessment so um, uh, you mentioned that uh, citizens can now do science on their own, and uh, in Kurt's talk that uh, some people have actually been doing assessments. How do we incentivize people to do assessment, aside from professionals? Uh, that's, I, I, find my, I can jump, that, that's one of the questions we're really working on right now, um, and trying to think about what kinds of game mechanics um, can you put in um, whether it be meta game mechanics? So, so we're looking at things like the you know the karma system at Slashdot, which has been around forever, where people kind of assess the quality of various posts. Um, it does seem like certain kinds of people have a um, natural inclination to try to do some of this, but I mean I think it's a tough design decision that we're trying to we're trying to build on working you know to make that an interesting experience and build those sorts of things in. Um, but like I said, I, for my own answer, I'll believe that we. We've got it when I see it, because <laughs> we don't quite yet. I don't know what you guys, because you've, you've I, had a lot of success. I, I have a simple uh, thought about this, and that is one of the reasons for doing assessment is that you can have impact on the environment that you're testing. And if we can make that connection uh, in a more meaningful way, then you incentivize doing assessment and doing it well. It's an abstract answer, but I think that one of the big problems is that it's disconnected. Um, yeah, I, I think that like you know everyone is different. People have kinds of like different motivations, and there may be some people who are just inherently motivated to like assess and rate what other people do. But I think a lot of it could be sort of like the community, you know. And some a lot of people like to uh, self kind of like assess as well and see how they're improving and. Um, and uh, over time, you know, evaluating themselves in their own personal progression. But I think a lot of that can come from sort of like community and, and people wanting to give feedback to each other. Um. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, let's give them a big round of applause.